Hello, today in Modern Church History, we take a second look at the life and ministry of Hendrik de Kock, who has been called sometimes the Dutch Martin Luther because of his great boldness and courage as he led a reform movement among the Kleine Leiden, that is the small people, the, the people who are not famous in the Netherlands as they engaged in what we call the Afscheiding in Dutch or the succession in English. And so at the time we speak, Pastor de Kock is out of his pulpit. He is prepared to stand against all the authorities of the day, which include not only the authorities within the Dutch Reformed State Church, but also the governmental authorities in the Netherlands. And this led up to what we call, really, a Reformation Day in the Netherlands. It was a reformation that started in the Dutch Reformed Churches in the town of Ulrum, and the date was October 13, 1834. It could be considered a Reformation Day in the Netherlands. The digits of the number 13 are turned around from 31, while you students of the Reformation know that October 31 is Reformation Day, and that day of 1517, October 31, 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses against indulgence to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, and God used that to trigger the great Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. Well, God also used another event in October, this time on October 13 of 1834, to trigger a reform movement in the apostate Dutch Reformed Church. On this famous day in church history, the consistory of the church in Ulrum that Pastor de Kock had labored in and from which he had been deposed, approved and signed the act of separation or return. Courageous elders in the church asserted that the state church bore the marks of a false church as delineated in Articles 28 and 29 of the Belgic Confession of Faith. Those articles were famous, of course, in Dutch Reformed Church history because they distinguished between the false church and the true church, distinguishing between the Roman Catholic Church that had persecuted the saints at the time of the Reformation. And that article, those articles talk about the marks of the true church. The faithful preaching of the gospel is one. The proper exercise of Christian discipline is another mark and then the proper administration of the sacraments was a third. So it was quite something that these laymen, these elders and deacons in the church at Orem had to say that now the Dutch Reformed State Church had the marks of a false church. The act of separation or return which was the crucial document that the church approved and signed, stated that the state church militated against sound doctrine. They didn't properly administrate the sacraments. They didn't engage in proper Christian discipline. And instead, they persecuted true believers. These were the marks of a false church. The act of separation or return was an astounding decision because it was a decision to leave the state church. But the act was also a return, you see. These elders state that their decision is to return to the teaching of the Reformed Confessions. Instead of following the rules for church government used in the state church, for example, they said, we will return to the historic church order of Dort. Given the importance of the act of succession or return in Dutch Reformed church history, I will quote the statement, in length. It includes three large paragraphs, a closing small paragraph, and then the names of the elders who signed the document at the end. This is how the document begins, a very courageous statement. They say, we the undersigned, overseers and members of the Reformed Congregation of Jesus Christ at Orem, have observed for a considerable time the corruption in the Netherlands Reformed Church, as well as the mutilation or denial of the doctrine of our fathers based on God's word, the degeneration of the administration of the holy sacraments, according to the regulation of Christ in his word, and the almost complete neglect of ecclesiastical discipline, 
all of which matters are, according to our Reformed Confession, Article 29, Distinguishing Marks of the True Church. We have received through God's grace a pastor and teacher who sets forth to us according to the word of God, the pure doctrine of our fathers, and who applied the same both in particular and in general. The congregation was thereby more and more awakened to direct its steps in confession and walk according to the rule of faith and of God's holy word. Through this, the congregation lived in rest and peace. But that rest and peace was disturbed by the highly unjust and ungodly suspension of our commonly loved and esteemed pastor as a consequence of his public testimony against false doctrine and against defiled public religious services. They say, because not only is the previously mentioned corruption observed, but in addition, God's word is rejected or invalidated by ecclesiastical laws and decisions. And then they quote Bible passages where Jesus talks about how the Pharisees did that. And they say, and they persecute those who will live godly in Christ Jesus according to his own prescriptions recorded in his word. And then they have a whole list of Bible passages. And these are passages that are talking about things that they have been doing and, and for which they have been persecuted. They say, taking all of this together, it has now become more than plain that the Netherlands Reformed Church is not the true, but the false church, according to God's word and Article 29 of our Confession. For this reason, the undersigned hereby declare that they, in accordance with the office of all believers, that's Article 28 of the Belgic Confession of Faith, separate themselves from those who are not of the church and therefore will have no more fellowship with the Netherlands Reformed Church until it returns to the true service of the Lord. But then they also declare that they have an ecumenical spirit, and this will come into play, although it will be a little challenge when Abraham Kuyper leads the Dolianci out of the state church decades in the future. They, they say this, they declare at the same time their willingness to exercise fellowship with all true reform members and to unite themselves with every gathering founded on God's infallible word in whatever place God has also united the same. And then they talk about how they're returning. They're returning to the faith of their fathers. They say, hereby we testify that in all things we hold to God's holy word and to our old forms of unity in all things founded on that word, namely the confession of faith, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the canons of the Synod of Dort, held in the years 16, 18 to 19. We order our public religious services according to the ancient ecclesiastical liturgy, which would involve exclusive psalm singing, and with respect to divine service in church government, except for they would also sing a few doxologies, which, and for example, they would sing the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments. But they're saying we're going back to the Church Order of Dort and what it says about liturgy. And then they say, and with respect to divine service in church government, for the present we hold to the church order instituted by the aforementioned Synod of Dort, they say, finally, we hereby declare that we continue to acknowledge our unjustly suspended pastor. So they're saying, yes, it's true that the state church has, has suspended our pastor, but guess what? We recognize him as our legitimate pastor. And then they say this is done at Ulram, the 13th of October, 1834. And that's why I said that October 13th of 1834 can be considered a Reformation Day in the Netherlands. That will have an impact far beyond the Netherlands, to, especially in the United States. Other places too, though. And then we have the people who signed it. It's J.J. Buchema, an elder, K.J. Barkema, an elder, and then K.A. Vanderlaan, a deacon, and D.P. Ritzema, a deacon, and Gerrit K. Boss, also a deacon. Now, those are not names that live in infamy. Those are names that are famous. And those are the names of men who are great in the kingdom of God. Now, what is striking about this decision is that this Reformation was both a an act of succession and an act of return. Yes, it was an act of succession. It was a leaving of the Dutch Reformed State Church. But very importantly, in the very title they emphasize, it's also an act of return. Yes, they succeeded from, they left the Netherlands Reformed State Church, but they returned to the historic teachings of the Dutch Reformed Church. In other words, they are saying, 
We are true children of the Reformation. We are the spiritual offspring of our fathers. We believe in the great doctrines of the Reformation, while the people in the state church reject and oppose them. We don't know who wrote the act of succession or return. One of the elders might have written it. One of the ministers who supported the movement might have done so as well. Pastor DeCock did not sign his name to it. Marvin Camps thinks that DeCock did not sign the document because he could not succeed as a pastor from the state church because he had already been deposed as the pastor in Elrum. Now, in the 1500s, Martin Luther had faced great opposition from the false church in the 16th century. Well, the centuries had passed by and now it was 1834, but guess what? Human nature hadn't changed. The saints in the village church in Ulram also faced great opposition. The saints were opposed not only by the state church, but by the Dutch government. And a lot of social pressure was exerted on the saints. The Dutch king himself considered it illegal for the church in Ulram to succeed from the state church. In spite of very strong opposition, the reform movement would quickly spread. Well, what is striking about the succession is that it was a grassroots movement among poor and middle-class Christians in farming villages and smaller towns. These were the Kleine Leiden, who later on Abraham Kuyper would appeal to. These were not influential people in society. I can't think of a single prominent professor at a university who supported the succession. Most of the ministers, too, were not older men, There were a lot of younger ministers. Some of them had met in university, had some close relationships, but there were a lot of younger ministers without reputations, and they were deposed by the abusive hierarchy in the state church. Among the courageous ministers who joined the movement were men like Antony Brummelkamp, Simon van Velzen, who would go on to become a professor at the seminary in Kampen. There was Kassel Meerberg, Two ministers in this movement, Albertus van Ralti, who was born in 1811 and passed away in 1876, uh, and Hendrik Skolte, who lived from 1805 to 1868, would play an important role in the immigration of succeeder Christians to the United States. Albertus van Ralti famously led a group of succeeders to Holland, Michigan. How difficult things were for them. They came into Michigan at a time when the the forests were still almost virgin. They had a very, very difficult time initially. But these saints wanted to worship God according to their conscience with all freedom. They wanted liberty to have Christian schools for the education of their covenant children. As a result, there was a growing community of Reformed believers in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Zealand, and in Holland. And then Skolte led a group to Pella, Iowa there, where to this day there's a very large Dutch immigrant population. And also others moved to northwest Iowa to places like Hall and Sioux Center and Orange City. And others made it also a little farther north into Minnesota, to Edgerton, Minnesota, and places like Princeburg, Minnesota. These succeeder immigrants who came to western Michigan, Iowa, played a very important role in shaping the character of the Reformed Church in America, and then they played a role in the origin of the Christian Reformed Church and shaped it. Now, since many people in the Reformed Church in America assisted Van Ralty's group, when they came to America, he led his followers into the RCA. Other succeeder immigrants would view the RCA as insufficiently biblical and confessional, and they would form the Christian Reformed Church, which would have an important center of influence in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Back in Ulram, the new succeeder church faced great opposition. The government, with the encouragement of the state church, penalized the saints. They lost their church building. The government put the town of Ulram under martial law, Can you imagine something like this happening in the United States? Pastor DeCock planned to preach on October 26th, but the military said he could not. Sort of reminds me what churches in America are facing now with COVID-19, where 
Governmental leaders are saying that the church, churches may not meet and have services. Or they may meet and churches that have thousands of members may only have 10 people in the church. On top of this, the soldiers moved into the Dekak home. Yes. What the government did and the military did is they punish Pastor Dekak and his supporters by making it so that they needed to board, provide lodging and board for Dutch soldiers. And so the soldiers moved into the Dekak home, harassed them, these Soldiers would make demands on them with respect to food or where they would sleep. They would mistreat the people in the home. The governmental department of religion persecuted de Kock. He was found guilty in a kangaroo court that sentenced him to prison time in a jail in Groningen because he wouldn't stop preaching the word. And so Pastor DeCock was placed under house arrest in October of 1834. The government billeted soldiers in the parsonage. Pastor Hendrik de DeCock was thrown into jail from November 29 of 1834 until February of 1835. And while he was in jail, his wife was kicked out of the church parsonage. And then when Helenius de Kock, his wife, tried to find a home to rent. She discovered that there was such hostility towards her husband and her church, and that even in the town of Ulram, that no one would rent a home to her. Helenius de Kock, who was known as Helenius Venema, following the Dutch way of referring to even a married woman by her maiden name, she willingly suffered for the sake of the gospel. Later on, one of Pastor Hendrik and Helenius de Kock's sons was named Helenius de Kock, who later became a professor at the seminary compound, wrote that when his dad began to face great opposition, that his mom, he says, I quote, became ever more a source of encouragement and support, and she urged him publicly to take up the cause of the Lord, to bear willingly the offense of Christ. Even when his mom was kicked out of the parsonage, her son tells us that his mother was more concerned about the welfare of the saints in the church at Orem than about her personal situation. She endured great suffering at this time. In fact, shortly after the church in Orem publicized the act of succession or return, Hendrik and Helenius de Kock had to deal with a medical emergency. Their baby daughter, Yante, fell sick with cholera, and then Yante died. Meanwhile, Helenius was pregnant with a fourth child who would be born while her husband was in jail. And then money would become scarce indeed because the family had not received a salary since April in that year. We have stories about the faith of Hendrik de Kock's wife. For example, when he was back home again from jail one day, she demonstrated a fearless trust in the Lord to provide their daily bread. Her husband asked her one day, my dear, do we have something to eat? Her response in faith was, let us just begin, and if there's not enough, we will have sandwiches. Looking back at this time of hardships, Mrs. DeCock recalled, she said, we always were satisfied, and something was left over. God blessed the food. The government used various articles in the Napoleonic Code to persecute Hendrik de Kock and other pastors and the churches of the succession. And, for example, an elder or a member of the church who'd have the audacity to say, okay, we don't have a church building we can worship in. You can come and worship in my barn. The government drew on Articles 291, 292, and 293 of the Napoleonic Code to forbid the succession churches from meeting. Now, what had happened is that Napoleon had conquered the Netherlands in the early part of the 19th century. And the Napoleonic Penal Code included penalties for groups that met without government authorization. Napoleon was originally concerned about suppressing the freedom of assembly. He didn't want the Dutch, for example, to become rebellious. And so they wanted to suppress political dissent in the Netherlands. So they made these laws, that there couldn't be gatherings without approval. Now, however, even though the Dutch had been freed from Napoleon decades ago, 
The Dutch king used these codes that were somehow still on the books yet in order to persecute the succeeders. The government said it's unlawful for the succeeder churches to meet because of this rule. And they said that the worship services of the succession churches were illegal gatherings. Here's how the articles in the Napoleonic Code read. First of all, Article 291 said, No association of more than 20 persons whose aim is to convene daily or on certain days in order to be engaged in matters of religion, literature, politics, or other subjects may be organized except by approbation of the high government and under such conditions as the public authority will impose upon the association. Those who live in the house where the association congregates shall not be included in the number of persons meant in this article. Now, apparently they were afraid about people even meeting for religious reasons, but using that as a guise for a political meeting. So that's included. And then Article 292 read, Every association, as meant above, that has been organized without due authorization or that has violated the conditions as imposed upon it when being authorized shall be disbanded. The heads, directors, or administrators of such association shall be punished by a fine of 16 to 200 francs. So there you have it. Fines, and, and the succeeders would be fined. These weren't rich farmers. Article 294 was used against them, which said, Everyone who without permission from the municipality permits or allows the use of his house or room or a portion thereof for the meeting of members of an association, even if authorized by the government or for religious exercise, shall be punished by a fine of 16 to 200 francs. Well, the result of this is that succeeders were fined and then imprisoned as well for having meetings like this and attending church. And it was so hypocritical that the Dutch government retained these codes that had been meant to be used against the Dutch some decades before. They, of course, should have removed these statutes from the Dutch legal system. But King William II and the state church were happy to use these old statutes as legal grounds to persecute godly Christians. Since the state churches had seized legal control of succeeder church buildings, the saints worshipped outside or in barns. So the first generation of succeeder pastors knew the inside of jails. And guess what they did when they were released? They were like Paul and Silas, like the, the apostles. They courageously continued to preach, and they would be arrested again. The saints in these succeeder churches were poor, and yet they had to pay heavy fines. And they were penalized by having Dutch soldiers garrisoned in their homes. In this hated practice, the military would force the succeeders to house and feed soldiers. At the time of the American Revolution, this was something that the Americans were concerned about as well. They were concerned about a custom of the British doing the same thing. Here in the Netherlands, soldiers would move into the family of a succeeder family, into the home of a succeeder family, take over their bedrooms, mistreat their families, eat them out of house and home, and they made excessive demands on them. And what could they do? So the succeeder families experienced this intrusive and expensive penalty. And how many times was Hendrik de Kock arrested? More than 35 times. Early on, he spent months in prison. It was while he was in jail that one time, in fact, that his daughter passed away and his wife was kicked out of the parsonage. No doubt that ill treatment of de Kock by the authorities and jailers and the pressures of his work contributed to his early death. The Lord called him home at a very young age, we would say, at the age of 42. But how busy were the last seven years of his life as he led this reform movement? He was busy as pastor in Ulram, and then he became the pastor of a succession church in Kronigen. But the Lord in his all-wise sovereignty ordained that this busy pastor would fall sick. 
Hendrik de Kock had worn out his health by his traveling, his preaching, and then he was busy training ministerial students on top of all this. The Lord apparently thought that he had finished the race to which he had called him. And so the Lord called him home on November 14 of 1842. Pastor de Kock rested from his labors and his good works followed him to paradise. Following his death, a fellow pastor in the succession, Simon van Velzen, preached a memorial sermon in the succession church in Amsterdam, where he spoke of how Pastor de Kock had, he says, combined genuine simplicity with profound earnestness in his preaching. He lauded how de Kock had been, quote, the first pastor who publicly and without any duplicity exposed, reproved, rejected, and resisted the evil that had acquired dominance in the church. Also, Van Velzen celebrated God's grace in Pastor de Kock's life that had enabled him to suffer for the gospel. Van Velzen could say this about de Kock. He was defamed, summoned before the judgment seats, cast into prison, robbed of his possessions, and his life was threatened, yet he remained steadfast and always pleasant. Now that is the grace of God. And God also was merciful to his widow. He provided for de Kock's widow. After four years of widowhood, God gave her a new husband, Pastor Harm Hertz Pullman. And then she had the joy of seeing her oldest son, Hellenius, appointed to become a professor at the new succession seminary in Kampen. Now, the death of Hendrik de Kock was a great blow to the succession churches, but the Lord continued to reform his church. In 1835, the succession had six churches with 4,000 members. By 1854, the church had grown to a membership of 42,000. By 1870, the church had 270 ministers and 300 churches with a membership of 100,000 saints. And the saints in these churches sacrificially gave their gifts to support the establishment of a theological seminary in the city of Kampen. The succeeder churches would not only have an impact on the religious life in the Netherlands, but also in North America, the children of the succession would have an impact on the Reformed churches in Canada and the United States as well. And then on top of that, Reformed missionaries from the succeeder tradition would go out to the world from the Netherlands. They'd go out from the United States and Canada, and in this way, the reform work begun in Ulrum would actually have an international impact from South Africa to Indonesia to Australia to New Zealand. And a few decades later, another reform movement led by Kuiper, called the Doliansi or the Grieving Ones, would join with the succession churches in 1892 to form a united reformed churches in the Netherlands, the Gereformeerde Kerken in Nederland. Herman Bavig, who is from the succeeder tradition, and Abraham Kuyper from the other Doliansi tradition, would play an important role in fostering that union. And together, they would give biblical and theological leadership in the United Church. And so the Lord blessed that reform movement, started in the little town of Ulrum by an unknown pastor in an out-of-the-way place, and God used it to reform first the church in Ulrum, and then the church in the Netherlands with an impact worldwide. I think one response we need to have to this is that we need to be willing to be courageous too, like the elders in Ulrum and like their pastor. We in these last days too have to be willing to stand for the gospel and be willing to suffer with the same Christ-like spirit that Hendrik de Kock manifested.